Ah, video. Yeah. Uh, draft science. Uh, so, yeah, as promised. I really should do it. Um, I did read the text <laughs> you know, on this video. So, this is a double slit experiment video. Um, done really badly. Um, Jim Al Kahali. Something like that. Anyway, there's a full lecture video. So. I will have to go explore that. Um, and But let's do this 10 minute part first and then maybe in the future I'll find some reason to go back to that t the full lecture. See if it's as ludicrous as this is. Uh, but anyway, you know, let's, let's play along with this and I'll just add my crap as necessary uh, stuff, uh, commentary. Um, yeah, well, yeah, my I think you got it wrong. <sighs> I'm going to explain to you what's known as the central mystery of quantum mechanics. It was Richard Feynman, the American physicist, said, this is the central mystery of quantum mechanics. There's lots of weird stuff that goes on in the quantum world. Hit you with this, and it basically tells you what it's all about. It's yeah, well, whatever. Uh, it doesn't tell you what it's all about, but... Um yeah, you know, this is, so this is one of the things you can comment on, is the fact that, you know, there's quote mining from people, and it does get a little dangerous, right, because I could say something was a central something, and then ten years later I could say something else was a central something. Um, but there's a lot of things that were, you know, that you could connect the dots to. And so Feynman also found Newton's glass a very, um, I mean, it set up the questions you could ask. Okay, the obvious questions were, how does the photon know how thick the glass is? That's how it's behaving, right? The photons are reflecting off the surface of the glass as if they knew how thick the glass was. There's a certain percentage had to reflect off of it. And so, again, the, the, what I would almost argue is the obvious answer is, the answer to how thick the glass is, is somehow conveyed to the surface of the glass. The glass knows how thick it is. Now in the two slit experiment I would argue the two slits are manufacturing the results. The photons aren't doing it. The slits are doing it. It's called the two slit experiment. I'll start with this. Imagine you have a source of light shining against the screen with two slits. Now, for the pedants in the audience, this source of light has to be monochromatic light, light of a particular wavelength, well, whereas, of course, a light bulb is white light, and that's made up of all the colors and spectrum. Right, so shouldn't we automatically say if the effect is more obvious? It's not... It's like it doesn't. It's not like it doesn't happen with some with mixtures of light, but it's more obvious with monochromatic light. <clears throat> now, what does that say to you? That the the arrangement of the slits, the placement of them, I mean the the the, the bar pattern, the interference pattern, will be different um, in a different place based on the frequency of the light. So. You can't argue that if you're sending single photons that it should matter whether it's monochromatic light or not monochromatic light, if it's a light of the same frequency. That shouldn't matter to the creation of this um, irregular result. But clearly it does matter um, to how they interact with the slits. And that's sort of important, right? They're not just going straight through an empty hole. They're not just, if they were just shooting through the middle of the slit and they were not being influenced at all by the slits, then you could argue it shouldn't matter what their wavelength is. So lots of different wavelengths. But imagine this is just a single wavelength of light and you can see the light is coming out in, 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 uh, in waves like, like ripples in a pond. Right, but this isn't what's happening in the two-slit experiment. So he's showing it like it's a wave. The light is now completely a wave, and then he's showing the, the pattern here. 
So this is a total misrepresentation of the two-slit experiment because this isn't how the light is conveyed to the two slits. It's conveyed through an aperture that uh, creates a cone of light on these two slits. A cone of light that is itself already a manufactured or a filtered um, light. The light at this edge, the light here, the amount of light here and the amount of light here are likely not the same amount of light in the actual experiment. So you know, so what, what is, <laughs> what's the point of doing this inaccurately? It, did this, okay, maybe this creates some sort of simplification, but is that what science are supposed to do? Is they supposed to turn it into something so simple that it's not the same experiment? This isn't the two-slit experiment. That's the nature of you know, wave-like behavior. As the light hits the screen, it squeezes through the two slits. And each slit in turn. And so, why, why, why even say it squeezes through? What does that mean again? You know, in terms of the idea of how what we know about light is that it doesn't really do that. It doesn't squeeze through things. And we know a lot about light. I mean, there's lots of things that have done, experiments that have been done with light and lenses and refraction and crystals and. So this isn't, shouldn't be necessary to play a game as if this is how light is actually functioning. So it doesn't function that way. And on the other side becomes almost like a new source of light. And the light spreads out. So understand, in, in regular waves, this happens because of the adhesion between the atoms of the water. So the water is what creates the tension to transmit waves. So waves are as far as I understand it, always associated with a medium that has tension. Without adhesion, without tension between the atoms, you cannot sustain or convey a wave. It needs tension. It needs something elastic to be traveling through. So this argument has to be that the photon is traveling through a medium that is elastic to the photon's movement. And there's no evidence of this elastic medium. <sighs> diffracts. And as the wave... No point in using the word diffract, right? Because water waves, these are, this is a representation pretty much of water waves, don't do that. The wave here is created because of friction at these points, and that's what compresses, changes the speed of, these two sides of the wave. So the water is slowed down here, it's moving the same speed in the middle, and it's slowed down here at this edge through molecular friction. So that's what's creating this new wave is friction. And you have to have tension, adhesion between things to have friction. ...of light overlap, they will interfere with each other. So where a crest hits uh, a trough, they will cancel. Where a crest hits a crest, they will amplify and so on right and so <clears throat> other people have mathematically demonstrated this interference pattern by just kind of pointing out that if you take a triangle you know you can just do a lot of triangles and just say the distance between this point and this point creates a triangle to any one of these points and that that triangle is the math that dictates the the density of, of population at a certain area so, but there would be then the distance of the slit that is determining the, this relationship. Mm, I don't think it accounts for the, um, yeah, you have to use quantum mechanics to um, acquire the, the, the differential but again, this pattern, any, any sine wave kind of pattern has built into it what you could argue is a, a peak. Uh, so this would be the 16, the 8, the 4, the 0. And likewise, you could argue this would be the, within that, within that frequency, you could argue there's a peak to the wave, a 3 quarter position, a half position, and a, a 0. So it's sort of like the Newtonian, um, glass reflection in that it's a there is an all or nothing there too there's a nothing created there's a, a point where you can have no 
reflection off the glass and double the reflection of the glass depending on the thickness of the glass. And so on the with monochromatic light again. See, it's important because for each frequency of light, the the um, the arrangement of the matter, the the, the the thing it's reacting with, as it changes for one frequency, it changes for the other frequencies. So it shifts for all of them. So one that was at zero, so so at zero for say red light is going to be 8 or 16 for blue light. So the relationship between the frequency is going to have a, an effect on um, it's going to be they're going to be in a different part of the cycle depending on frequency. And so that would be what would mess up this bar pattern is the fact that light of various frequencies would end up having strong and weak at different locations. That screen, you end up with what's called an interference pattern, a, a, a series of light and dark fringes. Right. Well, they, you, 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 know, you can call them fringes. You can call them whatever you Where want. The way you, it's a pattern, okay? <laughs> it's a pattern, and patterns happen through a filter. And so all you can argue is that this creates a filter, and that again, our, it has to also be accounted that we don't have a clear description of exactly what kind of light is hitting these two slits. Is it exactly even? Is it the same amount of light hitting this? Is this hitting this? Is this hitting this? Is this hitting this? Has anybody demonstrated that? It's have either cancelled out or worked together in phase. That's fine. That's not quantum mechanics. That's a property of light that goes back over 200 years. Well, whatever. I, I mean, it's a property of light that goes back 200 years. So this presumption that light's doing any of that, that uh, light is acting exactly as a water wave. There's no other explanation for the filtered pattern. That's the arrogant argument being made here. Is there is no other explanation. It's just horribly arrogant. That we've known about since the early 19th century. Imagine doing the same experiments again, but doing it not with waves, but with particles. Do it with grains of sand. So this is the same experiment, but I've tipped it 90 degrees. Rather than waves that are spread out that wash up against the two slits and squeeze through, here you've got individual particles of sand, and each particle... Okay, and so this is he's using an example that slows everything down, which is nice. But it also has rules that are very different than the rules light's been governed by. So what you have here is gravity that's moving this sand down. So there's an extra force that tends to force it in a direction. So perhaps without gravity there would be enough static electricity between this and the sand. And you might have quite a bit of sand going like this. Um, you see this even with water dripping from a faucet, that it can be deflected in its path if, it's, if there is some physical object with which the droplet is moving past. It will move towards it or away from it depending on the charge created. So this isn't exactly fair either. This is a drawing. They, I don't know, would real sand create piles exactly this consistent? And obviously it wouldn't be able to show the exact location that each sand is falling because you're not cleaning the sand up. So your detector isn't anything like the detectors used for photons. You don't let the photons pile up on top of each other and, and disturb the, the results. These, this sand is not where it ends up in this pile doesn't have much to do with where it actually would have hit this surface. So this isn't an accurate, this isn't accurate either. Even for what it is, it isn't even accurate. But either go through one slit or the other. And so you see they will sort of drain through and you get two bumps underneath each of the slits. So I suppose this might be relevant if you're really going to, 
if, if, if you're going to say that we must somehow indulge the Copenhagen explanation, which is the photon has properties that somehow go through both slits, interfere with each other as equals, both having the same intensity, um, the interference, and then somehow that produces a knowledgeable result at the end where it lands somewhere connected somehow to the probability to a probability that's that's that it's required to fit into so even though it's a singular event somehow not affected by the slits it somehow has a knowledge of where to end up here based on what the previous photons have done that doesn't seem likely it seems likely that if there's a if there's a consistent result here the result must be being produced here there has to be something else moving besides just the photons unless you think photons know what previous photons have done if you're going to go back that far and say the photons know what the all the other photons that have gone through the slits have done um, you'd have to say there's some other regular mechanism some other some other wheel turning eccentrically that's creating this 16 0 16 0 and the 8 4 in between so the two peaks is reminiscent of particle like behavior whereas the the multiple pattern of interference is wave like behavior what if we do the same experiment with atoms well again you, you know you <laughs> The only reason why there's this, there's this this impression of wave-like behavior is these kinds of results. I mean, every other part of the examination of a photon is going to indicate that the photon is like a laser. It's just a photon. It goes from point A to point B in a straight line. That's the representation of a photon. And it's only in these special circumstances where it does anything wave-like. and the conclusion that it's wave-like is only because you're saying any bar pattern that ever occurs, any consistent pattern, is somehow an interference pattern. That something other than interference can't be creating it. Interference with, with itself, so to speak, in a wave way. When I know, if I, like I said, if I create an eccentric wheel, it creates a wave if you give it a medium to work in. So, if I argue that the sides of the slits are moving based on an eccentric wheel's turn, maybe faster in and slower out and faster in and slower out or something like that, um, it would be capable of creating the same kind of interference and it wouldn't necessi ne necessitate photons going through two slits. Uh, so imagine we have an atom gun, something can fire uh, at So um, now we're supposed to imagine something. Well, again, so he's doing the two-slit experiment by not going anywhere near the two-slit experiment. Okay, imagining things that aren't the two-slit experiment. So that's how he's explaining the two-slit, the double-slit experiment explained. And he's using examples that aren't the two-slit experiment. There is no atom gun Atoms, a, a stream of atoms, you can't see them because they're very small. Let's block off one of the two slits. So these two slits are... are so again, we have the standard um, silly drawing, right? I mean, it's just not the truth of how, how this experiment looks. It doesn't represent the actual distances or the actual sizes of any of these things. It doesn't explain that this gun is now is deliberately randomized so that it's made not to shoot straight. It deliberately doesn't shoot straight. And it's supposed to, in some way, perhaps, shoot in a cone of that is supposed to be random. Even though Newton already pointed out that if you put it through an aperture, it's not going to be random. You're going to create things called Newton rings. But anyway, let's not even argue about that. It, it, it doesn't point out what light is hitting 
and how much light is hitting. So when you block off this slit, is are you really, in the two slit experiment, most of the ways it has been done, is this actually blocked off without changing this or changing this? No positions are changed. And obviously, if you block off a slit, you have to produce half as many photons to get the same result here in terms of intensity. I'm going to assume. I mean, over time, I guess if you do it exactly the same amount of time, uh, it's a fair experiment. But, you know, if it's not the same amount of time, it's not going to be the same result in terms of the intensity. You know, the, the, the dimensions and separation of the slits is, is, is chosen appropriately to, to show us uh, how atoms do things. Uh, yeah, so it's chosen appropriately to show us how atoms do things. Now, isn't, isn't that... Yes, there's a focus to this whole thing. There's, there's a lot of rigging that goes into this two-slit experiment and refinements. And there's no conversation about those refinements. What happens if you make the slits a tiny bit bigger? What happens if you push them a little closer together? Or you push them a little further apart? No, no exploration of those circumstances or explanation of how they dramatically might change the results. And so far, so good. Nothing strange here. You'll see a lot of atoms hitting the back screen. So this will now have to be some sort of photosensitive screen where, whereby when an atom hits it, they'll, it'll give off a little... Yes, it will have to be this. It will have, So again, can't we describe a real experiment? Why is he describing a non-existent experiment and calling it the two-slit experiment? There's specific ways you count. You can count by... A, 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 a random um, bucket that you move back and forth or you can count by using photographic paper. There's different ways to count. Action lights to say the atom has arrived here. So the atoms are arriving as these little pinpricks of light that we see. Of course a lot of the atoms will be blocked by the first screen, they won't go through that slit. Uh, but those that do get through to the other side, you can see there's a bit of spreading of, of, of the atoms. But if we didn't know anything about atoms, we'd say, well, that's fine, we can understand that. Um, some, a lot of the atoms are going clean through the slit. Some are sort of maybe bouncing off the edge of the slit, and so they're sort of being... Yeah, well, the honest truth, though, is, is when they do this experiment with one slit, you end up with uh, the, uh, some fringing, okay? It's not as clear, it's not as uh, refined, but it exists. And that should tell you something, that with one slit you do create um, a bar pattern. It's just not as well defined. Deflected a bit, which is why you get a bit, a bit of a spread. Which comes back to arguments about the intensity of the light, which seems to be the critical factor, um, is in how much light floods it. So just like the the sun, basically the sunlight burns off a certain, uh, all the, 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 a certain number of ions in the atmosphere and it uses them all up. And once they're all used up, the sun appears more orange. The first mystery of quantum mechanics comes when we open the second slit. Because now we see something that's very much like the interference pattern we got with light. Right. So, so now he's saying we got with light when what he described was what we got with water waves, but regardless, it doesn't really matter. Um, why he has perverted this experiment into a, an, an experiment on atoms, which have, it hasn't been done, and which would be theoretically, you would get a result because the quantum effect would be so much smaller by mass, it would still exist, but it would be so much smaller that this, this would be a hundred times, a thousand times fainter. The quantum effect is a, 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 a nuclear effect, I mean, you know, a subatomic effect. So it exists, if, it would exist with bowling balls, but if you use bowling balls, the percentage of the quantum effect would be so tiny that you would never be able to detect it. It would have no, no, no practical influence. Other than having two bands 
of, of, of uh, spots where the atoms have gone through the two slits, it's as though the atoms have gone through the slits behaving like waves. And, 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 and you get interference of the waves and you get these bands. If we know nothing about atoms or quantum mechanics... Well, technically, we wouldn't get these kinds of bands. We would get... There would be small black bands and broad white bands. So this, <laughs> this isn't even an accurate display of what the actual bands look like. The bands are very broad, the dark bands are very narrow, so it's an exact reverse of what you actually get in the experiment. So again, what's what this is just it's garbage. It's garbage. You could try and rationalize it and say, well, you know, maybe atoms behave in a very strange way and um only a certain number of them are allowed to all sit together. And so, yeah, me and my gang, we're all going to go on this slit. No, sorry, no room for you. You go to the next slit above. And by the way, there's this rule that no one can go in between the, the two bands that a few naughty atoms do. So there's a bit of a, a scatter. Yeah. We don't... There could be some forces between atoms that make them coordinate their actions in a way to give this pattern. Who knows what he said there, right? Uh, yeah, the problem with atoms would be, yes, is that you'd have a problem that atoms have cohesion to each other. They have, an, they have charge and attractive force, and so this might be a little messy. Um, so, not a great idea. That's not mysterious. That's just, we just don't know how atoms do things. But we can be clever, and we can force the issue. What if we were to not send the atoms all through at once, but send them through one at a time. Leave enough of a gap for the atom to get through to hit the screen. Of course, as I say, some atoms will um, hit, the, uh, hit the, the, the first screen and not get through, but those that get through will hit the back screen. So let's run the experiment again slowly, and gradually you'll see as the atoms go through, they'll be, look like they just randomly arrive yeah well whatever again this hasn't done with atoms so it's this is just such a lie when it's done with electrons it's done within a crystal not two slits I, I mean this is you know this is just such a distortion and when it's done with photons yeah they're photons you can't be sure how many what what you're what you're creating when you create a photon what officially is a photon I might argue that a photon is at least two quanta um, it has a beginning and an end. It has it has a, a a frequency, and the frequency is created by more than one photon, technically, um, being associated with each other. So that's another element to this thing: is that you have to deal with this wavelength thing in the sense that you are creating whole wavelengths of photons. Um, phot I would argue that a photon's character, what it is is defined by its period, its frequency, its association with uh, each other. So that photons essentially have to be in pairs to be recognized as a photon. So that might be important, but it's going to be ignored in this. On, ...on the other side. You keep sending atoms through one at a time. <clears throat> well, again, one at a time in irregular irregularly at the best they could do was create some sort of filter that prevents photons from getting through and slows down how many get through but again without first showing us that we're getting even distribution between the two slits you know it's sort of deceptive um, are is most of the light confined to you know is 90 percent of the light inside the two outside edges of the slit or is most of the light outside that periphery? Where is most of the light going? It's a valid question. And gradually, that same pattern appears. So, each atom by itself is somehow contributing its small part to the overall wave-like behavior that we see in the interference pattern. Yeah, right. So what you're basically saying, again, is if their photons are going through individually and you separate by, like, say, a day or a month and the same pattern shows up, 
then what's the logical conclusion? That the atoms or the photons or the electrons, whatever you're using, somehow know what the other photons have done and have decided their probability based on what they know happened six months ago? Or is the more likely answer that the thing they're going through, the, the slits, have a probabilistic cycle? And that no matter when they go through, that cycle will be cycling. And if you just randomly throw them through any portion of time without being coherent to their cycle, as long as you're random to that cycle, you'll that cycle will reveal itself. And that's what the, the bar pattern is. The bar pattern is the cycle of the atomic structure of the two slits, or the middle impediment really, showing its vibration. How does it exist? How, how, how does, we know the atom is a tiny localized particle, we can't see it, it's too small to even see under a microscope. It doesn't matter, again, this is not the double slit experiment, it's not done with atom guns. So why are you doing this? Why are you talking about atoms? When you know even if you could make an atom gun, atoms would not behave, they would not create the same intensity of a bar pattern because the quantum effect, the vibration of the slit, <laughs> from my perspective, um, would not be as strong. It wouldn't have as much influence. We're firing it at the, the, the screen with the two slits. Some moment later, you see a flash of light on the back screen. It's arrived in a localized point. It's not spread itself out. You don't get sort of like a wash of, sort of a, a faint light across the whole screen. It's a little point. The atom is localized. It's arrived in a certain location. And yet, it somehow seems to have been aware of there being two slits, not one, because it's given rise to this interference. Well, it's not, it hasn't been aware of two slits. Your, your plainly, your Copenhagen argument is, is that it went through both. Some entity, some portion of its function itself is so wide and broad that it somehow managed to go through both openings. There was so much of it. And somehow it didn't get this, this energy, even though this energy or whatever it was, this, this wave function is able to go through slits in atmosphere okay but it can't go through the matter so it's not absorbed by the matter it's not affected by going through matter but it somehow can go through atmosphere so it can go through some atoms but it can't go through other atoms this this more generic thing i mean understanding why it, you know it's 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 um intuitively sensible to understand why um, a big thing, a photon, a solid thing, something, the, the end result photon, to understand why it ha can navigate different atomic structures based on chemical composition. We could, we could speculate that there's not enough mass, um, you know, not enough atomic mass um, to block the photon, so therefore the medium can be transparent like glass or some other thing or it transmits photons easily, which is really what glass is doing. It's transmitting photons through it. It's, it's absorbing them and readmitting them through itself. How does one atom do that? Does it split in half? Does it become like a, a cloud that goes through both? Well, we... See, all you, and again, and, and I, I would argue the simplest way I can explain that may not be accurate, but I'm just saying as a counter argument, is that you could create a wave pattern in a wave machine with a two slit experiment without ever having a wave coming towards the two slits. All I have to do is vibrate the middle pedestal. If I vibrate the middle pedestal, I'll create two waves, they'll interfere with each other, they'll create the pattern. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I mean, we know atoms vibrate. We know they're moving. We know they have um, very rigid energy levels to their electrons. Their electrons can only jump four energy levels. 
and that they're all or nothing. And in some respects, isn't the interference pattern look a lot like that? Look a lot like a representation of that? Doesn't the bar pattern look like it's representing the structure of the atoms, not the structure of the photon? We can try and be even cleverer. What if we were to spy on the atom and see where it goes? All right, now this is where it goes completely out of bounds, right? I mean, he's already hit foul ball after foul ball after half foul ball. But this is a, a flag. You know, some, I don't have a yellow flag, but somebody should throw one, okay? Because this is a foul. This is a penalty. This, this no physicist should say this shit. If you gently just observe which slit it goes through. So you put a detector just above the upper slit that will flash or beep whenever it sees an atom go through that top slit. So again, sees an atom. So maybe that's why he's using atoms is because he wants to be able to see them. But we know we can't see photons. We know we can't bounce photons off of photons to tell where a photon is or to, to tell that it exists. We know we can't do that. Um, because somehow photons just don't react to each other. You can't bounce anything off a of frickin' photon. Okay, all you can do is absorb a photon and readmit a photon, and you can recognize when an atom has done that, but you can't do anything else. So this whole idea of detecting or seeing, seeing, is a lie. This is, a physicist shouldn't use the word see the atom. You're not going to see it. You're going to detect it, and the only way you can detect it is to highly get in its... You have to really, really, really do something kind of aggressive to see it. It's going to have to actually push something or bang into something. And we know <laughs> that all small pieces of energy won't do that. You have to absorb them or you don't absorb them, but you can't just play with it. Sure enough, you fire the atoms through, one at a time. Again, not happening. It doesn't happen in any experiment done on Earth. There's no atom gun. This experiment hasn't been done with atoms. This is just a lie. If it's done with electrons, you have to detect electrons a specific way. Electrons won't even travel unless you create a, a vacuum for them to travel in because they, they're going to interact with the, 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 the... They're too reactive, and the atoms in the atmosphere, they will bang into and spark and release photons all over the place and do all kinds of shit. They can't be pushed around in an atmosphere. So now you're back to doing this thing with light. I don't know why he's not describing the two slit experiment as it should be done, which is with light. Fifty percent of the time the detector will be. The other 50% of the time it doesn't, the assumption being that the atom has gone through the lower slit. So again, no, he makes no concession to the fact that we have no detector detecting means that isn't highly disruptive to the system we place the detector into. So he's not even making a concession to the fact that this, can't, this experiment can't be done the way he's describing it. There's no such detector. But of course, I've been cheeky here. I haven't shown you the results of the experiment. That's what you get. 50%. <clears throat> right. Now, if this experiment has been done, which I don't even know if this has been done, but let's just say it has, what you can assume from this experiment is that the detector has now interfered with the photon, and like I said, this would be done with an electron or a photon, never with atoms, and that the detecting device itself is creating an energy field, and that energy field has now changed the direction of the photon. It's either absorbed it and readmitted it, or it's fundamentally obliged it to go right through the middle of this slit. It's changed the influence. And again, if the influence here is because of the vibration of the static electric field 
of this material, it has a static electric field going around it, if the vibration of that field is what's creating the pattern, obviously the field being created by your detector uh, may well have rendered this moot as an influence. But clearly, sensibly, that's the conclusion. The detector is changing the slits. To the time, it beeps, and you see a spot arrive adjacent to the upper slit. The other half of the time, it doesn't beep, but you see a spot arrive at the lower slit. So, yeah, it's picked out the atoms that have gone through the upper slit, and not the ones that have gone through. So each atom does go through one slit or the other. But that's a different result to what we had earlier. So here's the last bit of sneakiness that we can play with atoms. Surely now, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get... Well, like I said, this is the one you should go to scientific jail for. I mean, they ought to have a jail for scientists of some kind. You know, no Twinkies and whatever. No chocolate milk. To grips with it. Leave the detector there, but just very quietly go and unplug it. Right. Now, if, if the detector experiment was ever done, it's never been described as unplug the detector. That would mean you essentially now have a brick. You know, you just put a brick in the experiment. Okay, over there. Three feet away, there's a brick. Yeah, obviously, it's not going to change anything. Whether the brick is, you know, you unplug, you unplug the detector, you've turned it into nothing. It doesn't exist now. It's not creating a field now. So unplugging is just a silly thing to say. And when they describe this experiment as being done, which I don't believe it ever was, but when they described it as being done, the point was is that you left the detector, you just didn't record the results of the detector. So if you let the detector tick, okay, and beep, but beep in a silent room, then somehow the bar pattern returned. Now, I'm saying that never happened. The experiment was never done. It's just a Dr. Quantum lie. And now this guy's perpetuating the lie. Where You know, he's spent his whole life, he says, as a physicist, devoted to physics. And what? You believed Dr. Quantum? Don't let the atoms know that you're not spying on them. Make them think that you're still detecting them. So, yeah, 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 okay, we're going to run the experiment, atoms, okay, get ready, one at a time, we're going to be checking on you. All right, so, run the experiments again. Okay, so this never happened. This non-detector pretending to fool the atoms or the electrons or the photons, this never happened. He's describing something that's never been done. It's just a fable. It's fucking Goldilocks. So he's he's you know, he's drawn us a picture of a Goldilocks fable, and they've called this science at the Royal Institution. And I'm supposed to say what? You people who are saying I'm not allowed to challenge these brilliant people. This is brilliant. This is brilliant science. No. This needs to be challenged. Now, if you can explain this using common sense and logic... Yeah, well, of course, I can't explain your three bears made-up story. Because it didn't happen. It has nothing to do with what's actually been done. And it has nothing to do with a rational interpretation of evidence, which none of you people seem at all interested in. Do let me know, because there's a Nobel Prize for you. I wish, okay, it was that simple, okay? I know, I, I think I'm going to have to do a little more work than that, but yeah, I know, I think I've already explained it. It didn't happen. So do I get the Nobel Prize because I'm going to tell you your fake experiment never happened? Do I get a Nobel Prize for that? <laughs> yeah, because that's all I need to do to explain your fable, is to say, it's a fable, Quantum entanglement mm, well, is the idea that particles, however far apart they are, 
Still somehow, their fates remain intertwined. They, uh, they are still aware of each other's existence. Yeah, well, we've already done that. They're still aware of each other's existence. I mean, this kind of talk is really scientific, isn't it? The photons are aware. <sighs> anyway, those hurt the brain. So anyway, my damn computer blue screened. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm rendering a video and set to start over. It's really everything. But I am getting a new video card, so hopefully that will fix this problem. Hopefully. Uh, can't wait. No, because then I can take the video card out of there and put it in over there. I got it. It's got to be a win somehow. Pretty damn sure I'll win. But I'm losing everywhere else. Well, I mean, I got a bad week coming. I got a, uh, anyway, water heaters. I mean, it used to be water heaters would last 30 years. I mean, regularly. It lasts 30 years. No problem. Yeah, 30 years. I mean, you're lucky you get seven years. I mean, it's such a hassle. I mean, you know, if you have to live with your water heater, you know, if you don't have a big house and you have to cram everything into a little space, you know, water heaters going bad is just such a mess. If. If. Anyway. No, I just want to complain about it because it's really, it's really irritating. You know, I'm just having a bad week and it's just, this is just more bad. And it's just like you're saying, oh no, the river of bad is coming. I mean, I know there's just more coming. You know. And it's just, oh no. So I really don't have any patience for it. But anyway, I'm just sick of everything. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The video therapy. Sorry, I was just doing a little therapy on myself. You know, just a little bit. Yeah, I need to talk about it a little bit and just complain a little. So I feel better now as I complained a little. No, I don't know if I really feel better. Um, but I'll do better. There's fruit flies. Get out of there. Shoot. Fuckers. Alright. Um, and I missed an auction to do this video. There's another one coming, of course, but I mean, just, you know. I've been missing, like, all the really great ones. You know, 33 cent auction. I love those 33 cent auctions. But yeah, that's the thing, you know, water heater, yeah, it's going to be 400 bucks, and shit, it's irritating. Just been a bad, you know, I'm not desperate, don't get me, no, not begging, not saying anything. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll be okay for another year or two or three or whatever, but I'm not going to last that long anyway. Um, that really doesn't matter. You know, but I'm obsessed with saving money. <laughs> and, but yeah, it's just been one of those years where, whoa, this year was like a... I really lost money this year. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't a good year for, yeah, I, I lost more than I made this year. So, yeah, it was a deficit year. So that's not good. Anyway, that's another complaint. I'm, I'm, you know, just, just feeling vulnerable and, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, a little bit of psychotherapy with science is probably sensible. All right, it's probably totally inappropriate, sorry. Yeah, totally inappropriate. Okay. Anyway, till next time. And such. So I'll post this when I can. i got to wait for this video to render, and then I can post this. But I can't post it while this video is rendering, because something will blow up. Anyway.